This one's a bit of a free parter. A build video, fixing video, as you will see, and a music video. So hang around to the end for that. So I was lucky enough to come across one of these cute little function generators that just send out different shape waves at different frequencies and different amplitudes. It's a nice little thing to use for test circuits. You used to be able to buy it as a kit from Maplin, which was the UK version of Radio Shack. So it's a bipolar DC supply. You've got ground here, the positive nine volts and negative nine volts. And these are banana sockets. So I want to find an easy way to supply power to it. One way you could do it is with two 9 volt batteries. Connect them in series, tap off the middle, that can be your ground reference, and then on this side is going to be plus 9 volts, and here that's going to be minus 9 volts. Overall these two batteries are going to add together to make 18 volts. But I really don't like batteries, they always run out of juice just when you need them, so there's got to be a better way. Well my Eurorack supplies that I've made are plus minus 12 volts, so I figured the easiest way is to take the power from here and using some 9 volt regulators just take it down to 9 volts. So seeing as the power is going to be taken from the Eurorack case why not make it on a Eurorack panel. So we got some banana jacks and matched the colours and also some matching banana leads. So looking at the components that we're going to be using we can start to figure out how we're going to construct this. We're obviously going to need a ribbon cable coming from our Eurorack supply so that needs a pin header and the voltage regulator Regulators are going to want some little capacitors. Those components would fit really well into a piece of stripboard. The dilemma comes when you consider that the panel would look nice if we just had three of these banana jacks coming out. But then how are you going to mount the stripboard to the panel? Well, looking at the back of the banana jacks, I reckon I can jimmy a way of attaching them to the stripboard just so it looks nicer. And, you know, this is really an insight into my overthinking of stuff because it would just be much easier if I put a standoff on it. But I don't want to. So it's difficult to know where to start with these little projects sometimes, even something as relatively simple as this. Always a good place to start is just with what you already know and just work out from there. So I know that I want three of these banana jacks on the panel. So let's work out the spacings of those and then that should inform the spacings of all the other components on the strip board. And let's put a dot here, let's put a dot there. I think it's about there. Now I've got three holes that these can pop into and they can be soldered on the back. Obviously we're going to have to cut some of the tracks so these aren't getting joined all together electrically. We can put that over the panel and cut some holes in the panel. Measuring is for people way cleverer than me. So let's just eyeball it. Always good to use a little centre punch just to get a little divot so it will guide your drill when it starts off. This is made of uh, FR4, a fibreglass type material which is really not good for you to breathe the dust in. Now because this panel does have a layer of copper underneath this black solder mask you can't have this metal bit touching that copper layer otherwise it will just connect it to the other plugs on the panel. So these banana plugs have a little plastic cover and that's going to insulate us electrically from the panel. Drilling stuff up in the air, holding it in your hand doesn't really ever end up well. Best to get a bit of scrap wood and you can put some proper downward pressure on it. There's our three holes, let's screw the banana jacks in. And look at that, looks pretty good. That's what I had in my mind. Next step is to work out all the spacings of the components, cutting traces and getting stuff soldered on. Makes sense to put the pin header, which is connecting our ribbon from the Eurorack power in the middle. The ribbon cable is connected like this and on our strip board the tracks are running horizontally which means that these pins are going to be connected horizontally. I'm going to be releasing things from my cheat sheet book as well. This is really helpful. Uh, all resistor values, capacitor values and uh, IC things, even Baldo code. Keep an eye out for that on Patreon. Of course though because we need to solder on this side of the strip board and this needs to come in this way. The other side of the strip board doesn't have any copper on. So what we're going to have to do is a little trick. Take your pliers and grab it like that then put it down on a metal surface and push that plastic bit all the way down so that it now looks like that. Then we can put it in through the back way and solder on the other side just like this. 
So we got the ground connected along this strip into the ground but also at the moment connected into these two which we don't want so let's cut some traces let's look at our regulators we've got a 7809 which is a positive regulator and our 7909 which is a negative regulator and they actually do have different pinouts so got to look out for that that could catch you out very easy what we're going to do on the positive regulator is send in plus 12 volts to pin one pin two it goes to ground and pin three is going to output our plus nine volts on the 7909 pin one is taken to ground pin two gets the minus 12 volts and pin three will output our negative nine volts and also in the data sheet they suggest putting a couple of capacitors from the power input and outputs to ground just to smooth out that dc supply a little bit and since we're massively over engineering this anyway we've made as well add some reverse polarity protection so we're just going to use some diodes and sometimes in Eurac modules you'll see shock key diodes used special type of diode and the reason why is because they drop less voltage so 12 volts coming in they'll drop about 0.3 off that so go into your module you'll get 11.7 volts but seeing as the whole point of this is to drop down 12 volts to 9 volts we don't have to worry about that so let's just use some run-of-the-mill 1N4148 just your usual general purpose signal diodes they're gonna drop about 0.7 volts we just need two of those and the idea is that because we have the positive lead connected here and the negative lead connected here if we have a diode connected around this way and another one connected around this way if we connect this ribbon cable the wrong way around these diodes are gonna stop the flow of current so you can't send a negative supply to the positive regulator or a positive supply to the negative regulator the way to think about these diodes is the arrow shows you the direction that it allows current to flow in in the conventional model of uh, current flow confusingly of course electrons do flow the other way to how we imagine them in drawing circuits <laughs> yeah that's a whole other thing and this line here will stop the flow if it tries to come in through this way. So we're going to have our minus 12 volts coming in this side and our plus coming in this side. I've cut the strip board track so that we can put our diodes in and for the negative side the black stripe is going to want to be pointing towards the header and you can see why I cut the track. So this is where I want to put the voltage regulator for the negative 9 volts and just because there's a limited space what I'm going to do to connect the pins to where they need to go is just use some jumper wire. For for jumper cables that are going to just sit still on the strip board it's good to use some single core wire it holds itself in place quite nicely if you bend it like that you see but if you're going to have flying wires off to stuff and they're going to be flexing around all the time use stranded wire because the single core will break these automatic wire strippers were a massively good investment saves me lots of annoyance so we've got this little jumper here that's connecting to the negative 12 volts and then we've got a jumper going across here which is coming down this strip and getting connected across to the ground on the regulator and i cut the traces so that only the negative nine volts is going to be connected to the banana jack through this strip here. Capacitors, a 100 NF on the regulator output and a 330 NF on the input. These regulators are gonna get a little bit warm, so there's a bit of an air gap there, so it's not touching the wires underneath, can't melt through the plastic and then short them together through the metal on the back there. Yeah, I'm making this up as I go along. Same process for the positive regulator. Now what I'm also gonna do is short these three center ground tracks together, just so that the returning current can go through all of the ground wires on the ribbon cable. Well, it all seems good to me, so let's put some power to it and test it with our multimeter. Our black common probe, we're gonna connect that to the ground coming through the ribbon cable. And then if we look at the outputs of our regulator, minus nine, perfect. What's coming out of the positive regulator? Plus nine, beautiful. Um, with these type of regulators, 
you're never going to get an absolutely perfect 9 volts, but that doesn't really matter for what we're doing. So now we know that's working, let's solder the banana plugs to it and connect the whole assembly. Once we solder this on, we've kind of painted ourselves into a bit of a corner and it's not going to be easy to get to these, but you know, shouldn't go wrong and you shouldn't need to get to it. Holding the iron on for a long time because these big lumps of metal are sinking away a lot of the heat and you need that to melt and properly adhere the solder. We've now got nine volts coming out of the red plug and minus nine volts coming out of the blue. And here it is in the case. Not bad for a little bodge together thing. Moment of truth. So we've now got this connected. Let's turn it all on and see if it actually works. I hope so. Oh, nothing. Oh wait, there's a power on and off switch. Well, nothing's happening. Oh dear. Oh, all right. Well, I guess there's gonna be a part two fixing the audio waveform generator. What an anti-climax. Well, welcome to the troubleshooting section of this video. I've just opened it up and let's have a look inside, see if there's anything obvious. First thing to check are those connections to the power. And I can't see anything obvious from the back here, like burn marks or a cracked PCB. It's all looking a bit uh, scratched. I don't know if that happened when the person made this. It doesn't look though like any of the traces have been broken. Nothing really obvious. So we're gonna have to take these four screws out and have a look on the other side. My top tip when doing this, put everything in a tin or something so you can't lose the screws because they will just jump off and you will never ever see them again. <laughs> Trust me. Some etching on the board here. So the Maplin low cost waveform generator. There were some intermittent power problems. So sorted that, just some dodgy solder connections. And then when it did power on, there was a transistor just down here. And you see this little sucker? That started smoking. So obviously, that's getting a bit too much current into it. It's a case of finding the schematic online in an old Maplin magazine, and then having a look at what is connected to that transistor that could be drawing all the power through it. Started looking at the obvious culprits. They all looked pretty good. And normally you can tell when a component's gone bad. Had a really good scour of all the traces and all the solder joints, just to make sure that everything looked pucker. I just kept chasing all of the things that were connected to that transistor. And eventually I found it. It was one of these trimmers up the top here. So what the person who had made this had done is when they put these trimmers in, they bent the legs over so that when they turn this around and solder it, they don't fall out. But the problem was, in the process of doing that, they scratched this trace, and can you see that bit of exposed copper there? The leg had been bent over and was contacting that trace. These two traces should not be joined together. So I just desoldered it, bent the leg back, cleaned it up a bit, and no more smoke from that transistor. I think it's pretty likely that this actually never worked from the time it was put together as a kit. So we'll be the first people to actually hear it. <laughs> it's working. Listen to the other waves. It's the sine wave, the triangle, and the square. Should we see if we can get some music out of it? A little bit difficult with just this frequency knob. Right, let's get some rhythm clickies. And this only goes down that slow. So I'm gonna record it fast on the tape and then slow it down. Now what I've done is taken that click on track one and I'm running that as a trigger into the gate and shaping the amplitude of the bass line that I'm gonna record in with these envelope controls. up some chords, bounce it all down into logic and sprinkle a little bit of fairy dust.
there's loads more projects coming and the place to see them first is Patreon and that really helps support the channel. There's stuff up there already about the next project which is a mechanical GIF and electromagnetic animation and an audio download of The Ballad of Maplin. And check the shop link below because I make loads of synthesizer modules and DIY electronics tools as well.